Wow, you've got a nice empty airport there as well. <laughs> Good for you. So yeah, just to introduce myself, um, I'm Paul Lambeth. I live in the UK in uh, the North Pennines. The Pennines is a ridge of hills that runs up the center of the country, known as the backbone of, of, of the country. And uh, I've been here about 35 years. And I earn my livelihood giving shiatsu and giving other kind of health advice. I think of myself as a sort of health coach. I'll work with people no matter what they want. You know, some people come for shiatsu. Some people are open to dietary change. Some people want to learn exercises or meditation or relaxation techniques. Whatever they're open to do, I'll work with them. And uh, whatever we do, it seems to help bring people into a you know, state of greater balance. And as you know, once you are more balanced, then you behave in a more balanced way. So they become open to do more things. So we create a, a positive spiral of health. Um, so as I said, I've worked with all sorts of different people and organizations over years, over the years. Um, I have a particular interest in the nervous system, really by coincidence. What I found, that, uh, I don't know about you, Gennak, because you practice shiatsu. Uh, I find that, that I got a, quite a lot of interesting results over the years uh, with people with neurological problems. Things like MS, Parkinson's, motor neurons, um, people have had strokes or sometimes peculiar conditions like Miller-Fisher syndrome, which is some kind of virus that attacks the nervous system. And uh, so that just kind of prompted me to uh, look more closely. Uh, a lot of what I've uh, learned initially about the nervous system was with Shizuka Yamamoto and Michio Kushi and Saul Goodman and uh, uh, Rick Van Newton, uh, some interesting lectures with him many years ago. He has some fascinating things to say about the nervous system. Uh, so some of this is from there and some is from uh, experience over the years. I started um, studying shiatsu around the time my first son was born. I think you've met my first son, Jack. He's what, 43 now, so it's, it's a while ago. And uh, so this is just what's accumulated over the years. Although we're not gonna look at any specific conditions today. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard, but I've, sometimes people make an analogy between the human body and, and a motor vehicle, you know, your car. And they say, well, you've got to put the right fuel in you, yourself, just like you do with your car. Or, you know, you need a regular service just like your car. But a more interesting analogy along those lines I heard once was someone saying that uh, we're like a car in that the, a car has a chemical system and it has an energy system or electrical system. And, and that seemed like an interesting idea. And, and so that if your car has, for instance, a flat battery, it doesn't matter, you know, how much go faster fuel you put in the tank or extra additives you put in the fuel or how much fuel there's in there almost. Um, if the battery's flat, that car's not gonna go an inch. It needs a spark. You need the energy system to instigate the combustion. And uh, it's the same in the human body. Uh, Western medicine tends to look at our bodies as a chemical system, but of course there's an energy system there. So if we have a problem in our energy system, you can't go to the doctor and have them write out a prescription for, you know, life force three times a day or invisible key energy. Um, that's not going to happen. And, and so, uh, you know, the, the way conventional medicine looks at our, our, our body, as I say, is as a chemical system. So we tend to treat it with chemicals, pharmaceuticals. Uh, but what I found was if some, sometimes people are having problems with the, you know, what we'll call the energy system, they come along for shiatsu and uh, they seem to, get, as I say, seem to get some very interesting results. And that kind of makes sense because if your car's got a flat battery, you just hook it up to a battery charger. So a battery charger is a, you know, a functional energy field, a functional energy source, and you just connect that up. And, and if you don't have a battery charger, you, you take jump leads from another car. That's another functional energy field. 
So it seemed to me that maybe some of these benefits that people were receiving that had energy problems were just simply because I was a functional energy field and I was connecting with them. So to make those kind of changes, if you had a car battery and you were wanting to charge it up by using chemicals, you'd probably have to be very, very clever. And it's probably the same with the human body to affect the energy system using chemicals, you'd have to be very, very clever. But uh, these very simple traditional, you know, healthcare methods that we use with simple touch with shiatsu um, seems to produce some quite profound results. So one could be mistaken for thinking they were clever, but um, I've never fallen into that trap. I know it's all pretty simple, straightforward stuff. Um, now, one of the uh, interesting things about looking at the nervous system, you know, I guess all on this forum here, we all have an interest in macrobiotics. We're interested in understanding life and health in terms of yin yang. And uh, looking at the nervous system is uh, an interesting exercise in that regard and gives us, can give us deeper understanding and uh, a fresh yardstick with which to view uh, life. And uh, for people that are new to ideas like, you know, vital life force or invi invisible key energy, uh, if, that, if that seems a little alien, if we're more coming from a traditional Western material kind of view of life, then uh, looking at the nervous system is uh, something more tangible. It maybe seems more traditional, more scientific, and, and as ideas that can be grasped more easily. And I find it acts as a, uh, a useful kind of bridge, if you like, to understanding life force energy. And uh, I see this also as a reflection of the very function of the nervous system itself. Um, in the, the nervous system is like a kind of interface, sort of channeling our spirit, our life force into our, the reality of our sort of physical being, into our, uh, if you like, material manifestation of blood and bones and muscles and tendons and organs, beating hearts and, breathing the lungs. So let, I, I've actually got myself organized today. I've actually got a flip chart here. That means I'm organized. I don't do PowerPoint. That's way beyond me. So this is what we call the hillbilly PowerPoint. So I have this. I don't know if you can read it. It's, I don't know if it's for you to read or just to keep me on track so we cover everything within the time. So is that all in there? That's all there. We can adjust that. Bingo. So we have our digestive system, which is a more yin, more expanded system in our body. And that is complemented by our nervous system, which is more yang, more contracted. They have this antagonistic complementary relationship, which we see so often within our body. And so the digestive system being yin deals with the physical manifestations from the environment in the form of food, that being more yang. And the nervous system being yang deals with the more expanded, more yin elements from the environment, which is waves and vibrations, which would be more yin. So the digestive system and nervous system, they have this kind of seesaw relationship going on. So when the digestive system is active, that's up here active, the nervous system is dulled and becomes more insensitive. So today, right, it's just quarter past one now in the UK here, which is typical time when people will be having their Sunday lunch. People have a traditional Sunday lunch, which is a very heavy meal. And so after they've had that very heavy meal, you can guarantee the nervous system is pretty dulled. They're not sitting there composing poetry or things like that. <laughs> uh, they're just vegging out, as people say, although not on so many vegetables. And conversely, if we if we fast or eat very little, so the digestive system is doing very little, then the nervous system becomes more active. So we become more sharp and more sensitive. So this is going up and down through the day according to when you've eaten and when you haven't eaten and how much you've eaten, what sort of diet you follow. So the nervous system is divided again. So into two antagonist, 
uh, complementary areas. So the more yang central nervous system, which comprises of the brain and the spinal cord, and then the comparatively more yin autonomic nervous system. So autonomic means working automatically. So it's your heart beating, it's your lungs, you know, opening and closing. It's your intestines, you know, moving waste through. It's all these things that you don't, thank heavens, you don't have to think about. Because if you had to think about all those things, you wouldn't make it through an hour, let alone a day, let alone, you know, a great long life. And uh, so the great thing about the autonomic nervous system is it all happens with no thought. I like that. I like anything that happens with it, no thought. I'm all for that. And uh, so the function of the autonomic nervous system is to maintain balance between the internal environment and the external environment. If we, if we do that, then we stay in balance, we stay strong, we stay healthy, we stay alive. So let's look at the autonomic nervous system of maybe a tree, because the autonomic nervous system is more primitive than the central nervous system. We would say it predates it. We can see that because we see the, something like an autonomic nervous system in things like plants. So we take a tree, a tree or all plants, they tend to, when the weather is warm, they're gonna open up. They're gonna open up to take in energy. And then when it gets cold, they close up. You see flowers open in the sunshine. And then when it goes cold, they close up. That keeps them safe and alive. And so here's a winter tree, no leaves. So right now, well, not right now, we still got plenty of leaves here, but the leaves will be turning and starting to fall. And that's so that the tree is in balance to get through the winter. If the tree had leaves on all through the winter, it would die. It would be losing too much heat. Um, it would catch the wind much more, probably get blown over. And so by contracting, it can go through the winter safely in a state of balance. And then the spring comes along and the sap begins to rise again and new leaves return. And when the new leaves return, that enables the tree through the leaves to take energy from the sunshine. And of course, it's gonna keep the plant cool during the warmer months. So we could say that is the autonomic nervous system of the tree. There's a couple of trees near me that I'm particularly fond of. There's a beech tree. Now, I guess you know what a beech tree looks like. They tend to be very tall. Where I live about 20 miles away, there's actually the tallest beech trees in the country because there's lots of water. Um, but there's a beech tree near me. So there's a, there's a hill which is very exposed. So this is the exposed hill. And then there's a little gully with a, uh, with a beck, a stream running down here. And beech trees, I don't know if you see if there's beech trees where you live, but beech trees sometimes at the end of the summer, when the summer's been dry, you see they shed a big limb, a huge branch will fall off because it tends to split when it dries out. But this beech tree, this is a very exposed area. So the tree's grown here. It's very, very, very exposed. There's a strong wind, very strong winds come from the southwest. So this beech tree, the trunk, is about, I talk feet, is about four feet, about a meter 20 in diameter, about a meter 20 across, quite, quite fat little tree. And then, but it only goes up the same height, about a meter 20. And this tree is many, many years old. That's the main trunk. Instead of a great tall one like this, it's just that tree. And then the branches come out like this, and then they go up. It's like a cantilever design. They all come out like that. And then it's a big tree. So this is, I would say, the autonomic nervous system of this tree has made this tree grow in this way. And because there's this little stream there, it has its roots going down in the, to this, by this stream. So these limbs never dry out and crack. It's a fabulous tree. I like to walk there and just rest with my back against the tree. You know the way, you know, we think in sort of traditional societies, Someone that got real sick and recovered might become a kind of medicine man, you know, someone that's kind of been through a great difficulty. Well, this is a tree that's sort of taken on great difficulty, a very, a very exposed spot. And so I sit there with my back to this tree and it seems 
somehow, if it's got some sort of intelligence, I'm going to soak it up from this tree. You know, <laughs> we're going to have a little energy exchange. Now, there's another tree I like. I, I walked past yesterday, and this tree is an alder. Now, alders, um, the wood from alder can cope with getting very waterlogged and, and, then, and, and then survive. You can still dry it out and burn it. So uh, there's a tree down by the river. And if you look at it, it seems to have several main branches going up like this. And then it's a big tree. You know, it's, well, not huge, but it's about, um, about 12 meters high. OK. So you're just walking by the river and you see that, you say, well, that's a nice older tree. But actually, if you look closely down here, what's going on down here? I'll maybe draw it bigger. What's going on down there? There was a tree that fell over. So when a tree falls over, you get the, uh, the roots poking up like that. Does that make sense? So the roots are poking up like that. And then the trunk, I don't know if it got cut through, it's sort of hollow, there's just a small part of it. And then all this big tree here, that's just growing up from there. So this is a tree that's blown over and still some root into the ground. So it was lying over and there's a whole new tree grown up. So we would say that's the autonomic nervous system of that tree. That tree's got a strong autonomic nervous system, strong life force. Yeah, so that's like someone with strong immunity can survive through all sorts of things. So. This is, we want, this is what we want in ourselves. We want to cultivate strong autonomic nervous system so that we can adapt to whatever life throws at us. So that's what we're talking about today. So with ourselves, we would have seasonal adjustment. So right now we have, um, we're coming to the end of the summer. Um, the children will go back to school and go back to college. And what happens very often then, I, I don't know about where you live, but what happens here is the kids all get colds. And people say, oh, it's because they've all been shut up together in a classroom again. But of course, we know it's more than that. We know in the summer, it was warm and energy, uh, you know, the environment was very active. There was lots of sun. And so people were taking in more yin expansive food. They were taking in ice cream. They were taking in bottles of pop, they were taking in beer and wine if they were adults or whatever, and all sorts like this. And so just like the tree sheds its leaves when the weather cools down, we have to get rid of our leaves, we have to get rid of that excess yin to cope with the colder weather. And so it's a bit, I always think it's a bit like if you have a sponge, if you have a bath sponge, it's sitting there in the bathroom, it's been sitting on the side, you think it's completely dry, but when you pick it up and squeeze it, you get water from it, you get moisture out of it. And so what's happening now is the weather's cooling down, so we contract a bit, and when we contract, that comes out. So out comes that cold. Well, it, they actually, we have the cold virus that works symbiotically with humans to help that process, help that elimination process. In the UK here for many years, I think it's closed down now, but they had a place which was the uh, National Study Center for the Common Cold. They wanted to find a cure for the common cold. But of course, if they found a cure for the common cold, people wouldn't be healthier, they'd be more sick. That's like trying to find a cure for having a bowel movement or having a pee. You know, the body just wants to get rid of this stuff. What, you know, that would be the craziest thing. So that's, that's how dumb we are about understanding how life works. So, so we have those seasonal adjustments. We have day-to-day -day adjustments. You know, you might have a day in the summer when, when it's kind of drier, and then you get another day when there's more humidity. And on the more humid day, your autonomic nervous system will cause you to go and pee more. So you might not be aware that it's a, uh, you know, more humid day. And uh, you certainly couldn't figure out how much fluid you need to get rid of, but your autonomic nervous system just does it for you. You just find you're going to pee. Just the same as if you've been drinking lots of coffee or eating sugar or um, drinking beer or wine, your body wants to get that out of the system and it does it automatically. This is fabulous. If you're down the coffee shop drinking coffee with your friend, you're too, too busy, you know, chattering, gossiping away, thinking about all that stuff to actually figure out that you need to have a pee. Your autonomic nervous system does it for you. 
Same if you've been to the bar, you go to the bar, you have a few beers, then you've got no chance of figuring out how much you need to pee out. You couldn't calculate it. So autonomic nervous system does that. You may be walking past the river and uh, that makes you want to pee. We all know big yin attracts little yin. So the river makes you want to pee. So again, that keeps your system in balance. And so all these adjustments occur, which we may be in our society regard as sickness. Um, things like a cold. If we don't, if the cold, if we take medicine to stop the cold, which people do, then the problem's going to go deeper. We're going to accumulate and accumulate. Then we're more likely to get something slightly more serious. Um, what we tend to do with, you know, uh, over-the-counter medicines is they're more directed towards getting rid of these sort of inconvenient symptoms. And of course, what we learn in macrobiotics is we try and understand the process that's going on. So we try to make something like a, a, a tea, like, you know, umisho ban or something like that, that is going to actually help us contract and help us enhance that discharge process rather than something that's going to stop the process. And that way, we stay healthy. So we call these sicknesses of adaptation. But what happens is when the autonomic nervous system fails, then we can get real sickness. OK. That's when you run out of luck. That's when these day to day, these season to season things, day to day things turn into degenerative sickness. And so if we keep our autonomic nervous system strong, we're not, not going to get to that. So we're all here learning about macrobiotics. So we're learning how to adjust our diet when the season changes, how to adjust our diet and activity according to the activities that we have to do. If we have to sit down and write poetry, or if we have to dig a hole in the road or climb a mountain, we need slightly different fuel for that. But, um, and we can apply ourselves to that in, in, in all sorts of ways. But the autonomic nervous system is really doing that without us thinking. And that's why I love it so much. Less study, less books. So what's next? So with animals, the autonomic nervous system is very well developed and we tend to call it instinct. Yeah. So it's time to migrate. Birds and other animals, they just migrate. They don't go on the internet and look for a bargain. They don't look at their brochures to find the most fashionable resort. They just go. We don't know if they think about it. We don't think they do. They just think. Just the same as they hunt, they feed, you know, they run away when the bigger one's after them. They mate, they, you know, make a home, whatever. They, they care for their young. All these things they do on instinct. Um, when we get something like an earthquake, animals seem to know, or a tsunami. They just, well, I know is probably not the word, but they just, they go off. They find themselves going off and they end up in higher ground so they don't get flooded or they, they get away from where the earthquake is because of their highly developed autonomic nervous system. Now, humans are actually more evolved than trees and animals. So we should have a more evolved autonomic nervous system. Um, we call it intuition with humans. So we should be able to develop our intuitions. We should know if there's an earthquake coming and things like this. And so uh, if you go to like uh, a Zen monastery or you practice martial arts, all the activity that you're doing there is to strengthen your autonomic nervous system, to create that strength and sensitivity, to create that sharpness and, and sensitivity. So uh, I'll just mention before we move on. So with humans, there was a study uh, that Rick Vermeuten mentioned, I remember, uh, to do with people that his term was retarded. Uh, I think he meant people with Down syndromes. And their life uh, expectancy is much shorter than the rest of the population. And we would say that is because the nervous system is dulled. And uh, I think the study that showed that people were 
with that condition were far less likely to get kind of colds and flus. And so you would say that's because the autonomic nervous system is dulled, so it's not making those adjustments. So everything is just accumulating. In my experience, it's more, they either don't get them at all or they get them all the time. And uh, I have a friend who actually works uh, or did work within the NHS here. And he was talking about, he, he was in, he, his work involved um, setting up studies for things. So they wanted to do a study here in the NHS, why people with Down syndrome have a life expectancy, which is uh, 25 years less than the rest of the population. And they were looking at it in terms of the care, the care that was available to them. But of course, if we have our understanding of what the nervous system is doing, then we can see if it's dulled, then they haven't got the autonomic nervous system functioning in a way that will keep them healthy, that will give them more longevity. So I can't remember what's on the next page. It's going to be exciting. Oh, yes. Surprise, surprise. The autonomic nervous system has two branches. That's a surprise for you, isn't it? And guess what? One of them's more yin and one of them's more yang. So the orthosympathetic branch, that's more yin. That's more expanded. Um, but, so the, the nerves are more expanded and they're all over the body. Well, they go right up to the surface of your body. Every single hair on your body is connect, has a connecting connection with the orthosympathetic nerves, yeah? That's why, you know, if a big tiger walked around the corner, you'd feel every hair on your body stand on end. And then the parasympathetic nerves, which are comparatively more yang, more contracted. Um, so uh, the parasympathetic, they begin, uh, the orthosympathetic begin in the center of the spine and work outwards to, to the periphery of the body. And the parasympathetic begin around the sacrum and the base of the skull and go deep down into the body. So orthosympathetic nerve function causes the more yang organs to become more yang. So that's like your heart, your pancreas, your liver, etc. Orthosympathetic function of uh, nerve causes the more yin organs to become more yin. So it causes the bladder or the stomach or the intestines to actually expand, to be feel more bloated. So the parasympathetic does the opposite. It causes the yang organs, the heart, the liver, etc., to become more yin, to expand to relax and open and expand. And the para also causes <coughs> the more yin organs, the stomach, the bladder, the intestines, gallbladder, et cetera, to become more contracted, so to squeeze down. So if your stomach becomes more contracted, then you feel hungry. If it's feeling bloated, you don't feel hungry. So that's creating a feeling of hunger. So um, this is great exercise for yin and yang, isn't it? So uh, maybe to remember this, to help remember this, so the para being more yang, the energy goes faster. And so we know when extreme yin creates yang, extreme yang creates yin. So that's why this creates the opposite here. Whereas this is more yin, the more yin branch, the ortho, that's not so fast. So that just causes the yang to become more yang and the yin to become more yang, yin. So we combine the two branches for all kinds of functions. Uh, so, for instance, um, the bladder, the bladder, so the bladder is a more yin organ, so that will expand through orthosympathetic function. Now, uh, we have uh, the bladder has the sphincter, so the sphincter is a little yang valve, and so the ortho will cause the yang to be yang. So the bladder will expand and can accumulate P and the sphincter stays tight. So the P stays in the bladder. Now, the parasympathetic open, affects the other way. So the yang sphincter becomes yin, it opens up and the bladder, which is expanded, contracts. So when the bladder contracts and the sphincter opens, then you pee, you get the pee out of you. 
Yeah. And then once that's happened, as we know, yin always follows yang, yang always follows yin. So then we go back to ortho function and fresh pee starts to accumulate in your bladder. Yeah. Now, some people have problems. So for instance, um, they can't pee properly because the power system is too weak or it can't quite switch off from here. So they don't fully pee. Uh, my, my hobby of choice my whole life has been cycling. And if you go to a sort of big amateur cycle event where there's hundreds of people taking part, they have a big uh, barrage of toilets there. People go to the toilet before they do their race. And you see people going to the toilet. <laughs> you see people that are very nervous. You see them going several times because they go to take a pee, <laughs> but they're too nervous. They don't really get it all out. So a few minutes later, they want to go again. You might have had that for, must have been some point in your life you're nervous. So that's how the two branches combine. So the orthosympathetic branch is known as the, referred to as flight or fight or flight. So that's what it's all about. You know, back in the days when a tiger might walk around the corner, you had to be able to fight or flight. <laughs> uh, and so it expends and discharges energy. So it's creating tension and resistance in the body. So which closes and constricts our energy. Um, so the heart rate speeds up. So it's sending blood to the muscles so that you can run or fight or whatever. Uh, the breathing speeds up, becomes more shallow. Um, adrenaline is secreted and uh, you're breaking down glycogen in the liver. That's to go to the muscles to, to give you that energy to do what you have to do. Um, and this, this creates us more acid because once the breathing is more shallow, that we have more carbon dioxide and, and, the, and, and the body chemistry becomes more acid. Um, orthosympathetic uh, function causes a male orgasm. Um, the whole ortho function is more active during the daytime, during bright lights. If you're in a kind of modern man-made environment like an office or um, an airport, <laughs> even then, uh, then there's gonna be more ortho uh, type environment going on. Um, I'm just going to change this thing here. Try again. Not to worry. Um, yeah, kind of high tech, noisy environment. That's all going to stimulate the orthosympathetic response. That's going to put you slightly on edge, put slightly on that flight or fight. So, and the ortho, being in that ortho state, will inhibit digestion, elimination, sexual function, birth process, and lactation. So I think it becomes, you know, because you're in that aroused, alarmed state, your thinking is going to become more in analytical because you've got to size things up, a bit more discriminating, more judgmental, defect, defensive, protective, controlling, rigid, etc. So you're going to it's going to be more good and bad, more dualistic. Um, and we, and if we're like this all the time, because some people are just constantly in that state, we could become very individualistic. So sort of really hung up on the idea that the only opinion that really matters is one's own and, and just not open to anything else because you're in that sort of, you know, fighting fires kind of state all the time. So this creates a sense of alienation and, and separation life seen and, and, and the world is seen as a stressful and dangerous place. Um, if you find yourself constantly buying into conspiracy theories, then you have to look at the balance of your nervous system. That's telling you you're on that flight or fight response all the time. You will notice mostly people that um, buy into conspiracy theories never just buy into one. They believe all of them. <laughs> And so that's just a reflection of what's going on in yourself. And of course, the extreme state of that is paranoia. So that's some of the fun you can get with uh, when you're parasympathetic nervous or functioning, when you're author or function. So the parasympathetic branch uh, is in modern terms referred to as feed and breed, because those are the functions that it helps. So 
the parasympathetic is a, to do with accumulation and storage and preservation of our energy, um, the opposite of the ortho. So that causes the body to relax and open up. And so we can, so this is to adapt and create equilibrium. So enhances digestion, as I mentioned, elimination, sexual function, birth process, lactation. So your pulse slows down, your breathing slows down and becomes deeper. Um, so it, it's going to make you, you know, enhance your kind of state of peace of mind, make you feel more tranquil. Um, and it's going to emphasize the out breath. And we get a full out breath, then we get rid of the carbon dioxide and uh, our body is more oxygenated. I often hear people referring to when people are doing um, vigorous exercises, people gasping for breath. But actually, usually that strong breathing when you're exercising hard, the, the strong part is usually the exhalation. You're, you're exhaling the carbon dioxide to keep yourself oxygenated. You know, next time you, you know, walk up a steep hill or you're running or riding a bike hard or you know, lifting some, lifting a piano to help someone move house, that kind of thing. You observe that in yourself. So the thinking is going to become more calm and tranquil, which is going to give you a kind of broader philosophical view of life view. You're going to see how everything is interconnected. You're going to see that whatever's going on, it's two sides of the same coin. You know, there's a front and a back to everything. And so you just go with the flow in that regard. And uh, have more of an appreciation of nature um, when we're in the Paris state. Um, as I say, we see matters in perspective and have more of a sense of oneness. And so the para is more active at the nighttime when it's dark and when we're in nature. Yeah. And uh, sadly, so many people are completely lacking in experiences like that. <laughs> so many people are just constantly on that kind of flight or fight response. So the healthy balance is when the para is slightly more active than the ortho. And so that means our blood is going to be more alkaline um, and well oxygenated, ex oxygenated. So we're going to be energized and yet relaxed. So the para is gathering the energy and the ortho is directing and expending it as needed. Uh, so the ortho, in balance, we can adapt to almost anything. So without, so we have a state of acceptance without expectation. So we're kind of in the moment and we're not kind of hung up about what's coming next. And we certainly don't get angry. Um, whereas if you're on flight or fight, you're far more likely to get ang angry. So we have a vision and dream of the future, but we're flexible. Uh, we're not rigid about how it's going to happen. We're not hung up on it's got to go exactly this way. So we can go with the flow. So that's how we all want to be. So when, when the balance isn't there and, we're, and the ortho predominates, as I say, we're going to be tense. We're going to have rapid, shallow breathing. That's going to create an acid condition. Um, energy is constantly being di discharged without being replenished. So we feel really wired up and we feel burnt out um, and, and depleted. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, there was some um, research years ago in Canada, where they noticed if the nervous system's in a kind of healthy balance between the two branches, then, then, then we're in a good state. We don't have symptoms of sickness. But when it's slightly out of balance, then there's lots of symptoms occur, lots of symptoms of illness occur. But then when it gets extremely out of balance, some of those symptoms go away. So Western medicine being what it is, is some, some of these scientists decide well let's let's create a chemical that puts it extremely out of balance and that'll get rid of those symptoms it seems rather short-sighted and so so of course that is cortisone so if you're in the hospital or you've got a family member in the hospital and they're real sick and they try all these different things and then it doesn't work and then they try cortisone all of a sudden all these symptoms seem to go away and that's that's that sort of last resort and that means the nervous system has been completely dulled so those, those autonomic nervous system responses that were creating the symptoms has been switched off. And so it's known that repeated use of cortisones actually causes uh, uh, you know, the brain to be retarded. Um, now, uh, I've mentioned Rudolf Steiner here, I wrote him there, because 
uh, years back, must be some, must be near the beginning of the 20th century. He said something which I found amazing. He said, "In the future, we will have to be on our guard." I think he said, um, "We'll have to be careful because in the future, humans will be immunized against spirituality." And it seems that when we're living our life, you know, fighting fires in this kind of orthodominant state, then that sounds like what he was talking about. You know, people get out of bed with an alarm and then there's all this charging around the house and, you know, chasing kids off to school and all that caper. And, uh, you know, so everything's so horizontal, there's no time for what's happening on the kind of vertical plane. There's no time for stepping back and just seeing the kind of deeper meaning of the world. So we've still got a lot to get through here, so I'm going to have to race. I'm going to have to get my orthosympathetic system going, folks. So, yeah, a great way to describe it, I always find, is the body responding to touch. So when you're giving shiatsu, when someone, um, if someone comes and touches you, they come and prod you here, say, they come and prod you there, your initial response is going to be the ortho system, flight or fight. But if the quality of that touch is gentle and it's not life-threatening, then that flight or fight response, that can tone down and then the power can come up. And then that contact there can actually affect the whole body. It can make your whole body relax and create that kind of power response. And, and when that's happened, then, as we said, we feel in one piece. We feel kind of connected. So if I'm in a sort of harmonious kind of parasympathetic state and I touch somebody else, then I'm using the sense, using the whole of myself to affect the whole of their self. And, and it can be a, you know, uh, a relaxing and harmonizing experience for them and, and, and all kinds of benefits can come out of that. And uh, before we were, in, we were built, born, of course, we we're in the womb and in the womb, there was no light and day and hot and cold and up and down and all that. So there's a, more of a sense of oneness when we're in there, even if we can't remember it. And so, uh, Often when we're given a shatter treatment, we'll rock the body. And that rocking takes us back, if you like, that, that memory of that rocking motion that we experience. We're in the womb where it was dark and, and wet and what have you, which is much more that power response. So if we want the body to go back to that deeply relaxed state, we rock the body. And uh, you'll probably notice if you, if, you, if you were walking out the door and you banged your head on the door frame, you'd sort of... You know, grab your head like that. You just sort of hold it like that. And it, it's almost as if that kind of steady pressure somehow kind of focuses your body's, you know, activates your body's self-healing me mechanisms to that area. And with children, of course, what we used to do was swaddle them with babies. They'd wrap them up very tight. And so that's rather like taking them back to the womb. It's rather like replicating the pressure of that amniotic fluid when they're in the womb. So that takes them back into that relaxed state. So we wrap babies up like that and they sleep really well they feel secure and um actually i was at the uh the pet store and they sell these things called thunder coats it's like a baby grow suit for a dog so if your dog is afraid of fireworks you put this on so that's rather like swaddling your dog so it's going to put it on a power response so there's less flight or fight so it's not as afraid of the fireworks so when i saw that i thought oh i understand how that works of course, my dog doesn't think actually because she's not afraid of anything, but she just barks at the fireworks, <laughs> tells them to go away. Uh, and also some people today were, use like a weighted quilt. I don't know if you know that. On the bed, some people have a quilt that's weighted. So that pressure helps them sleep, helps them get into that parasympathetic response and get into a deep sleep, helps them switch off the busy mind and the, 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 the this and that of the daily life. So to get into that deep sleep. And uh, so, and yeah, just holding tight. Someone just holds you tightly, it calms you down. So if you're in the car or in the office, you're in a kind of high tech environment. If you're in the car, you're whizzing through space in this lump of metal and, and there's all sorts of things going on. So there's this constant, you know, flight or fight thing going on. There's the uh, unnatural environment with, with, with metal and, 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 and man-made substances. And so that is stimulating the ortho. So if it's stimulating the ortho, then the contracted organs, say your kidneys, they're gonna get a bit more contracted, aren't they? And the heart's gonna get 
a bit more contracted and the liver's going to get a bit more contracted. And the, say the intestines and the bladder, they're going to expand more. So you might feel that kind of bloating there and that kind of tightness in your back. And then when you get out the car and you maybe just walk into the woods or somewhere, you just feel your whole body, because those tight areas, they've kind of opened up and relaxed. And those bloated areas that are like an overblown balloon or a pressure cooker, the, the over pressure's been taken out of them. They kind of go, and settle down. Just like if you're in an office or somewhere or a, a busy high tech building and they turn and there's a power cut or they just turn off the air condition. It all goes, yeah. ah, I feel normal again. And so being in nature creates that. Um, some people use grounding mats um, so that they're in that you know high tech environment, but it creates the effect of them, you know, walking with your feet on the earth. If you walk with your feet on the earth or you go and, you know, hug a tree or whatever, you're connecting with that strong negative ions of the earth. Because when you're busy day to day and you, and you get in that flight or fight, then you have, you're creating, there's all these negative ions accumulating around you. Um, I mean, it's tragic. I, I think some people go for years without their bodies touching the earth. It's frightening, isn't it? It's frightening. So, uh, oh yeah, trying to fit all these things in. So if you, so yang is taken in by the para, yeah? Sorry, yin is taken in by the para, yang is taken in by the author. So if you go to uh, a fancy restaurant, you know, an expensive restaurant, it's all comfortable furnishings, nice paintings on the wall, some, someone's playing the piano, you know, beautiful music, all this stuff. Everyone's extremely polite to you and all this caper. And so, so that's stimulating the para because the para is yang and it takes in that yin from the environment, from the, from the restaurant. And so that means that the expanded organs like your stomach, for instance, that can contract. And so when that contracts, you feel hungry. And the pyloric valve, which is a tight little valve that will turn to its opposite and that will open up. So you can allow the food in and they're not going to rush you. You've got all the time and that, and you, they need to get you really in because you're going to get a big bill at the end anyway, and they don't want you to <laughs> explode. And so yet yeah, when you go to fast food place, then there, there's no tablecloth. It's, you know, it's like a four mitre top and then there's lots of metal and it's really noisy and bright lights instead of the kind of gentle lighting of, a, of an expensive restaurant. So um, all this is creating a stimulation to the power, to the author, to that flight or fight. So not only is the food harder to digest, the environment that you're in is making it harder to digest as well, because it's kind of creating that tension, those valves, the pyloric valves staying tight and the stomach's kind of, you know, still more expanded. So we've got a few minutes. What else have we got there? So what weakens the autonomic nervous system? So the parasympathetic branch is yang. So it likes yin. Yeah. So if we have too much yin, sugar, alcohol, coffee, drugs, and medication, then it loses its yang. It becomes less yang or more yin. So it doesn't function as well. If the ortho, the ortho is yin, so the ortho likes yang. And so if it has too much yang, it loses its yinness. It becomes rigid because of meat, cheese, salt, eggs, baked food, or even just too much brown rice. Yeah. So that's how the system become can become weakened. And so this is important. When one branch of the autonomic nervous system fails, then the other one takes over. OK, so as I say, many of us have really weakened our parasympathetic branch. So we haven't got that ability to accumulate energy, to feel calm, to take a kind of broad view of everything. Because so we're far more likely to just be get hyped up, get caught up in details, be fighting fires constantly. And that makes our body chemistry more acid and it and it and it makes our uh, our system weaker overall. And so so we need to strengthen that. Um, if the uh, flight or fight fails, 
sometimes that's dramatic. So, so normally if you were driving your car and there was a crash, a bit, you know, there was a big lorry comes hurtling across onto your side of the carriageway, then, then you're going to take it that, that that's a kind of violent experience, if you like. So your orthosympathetic takes in that yang to yang eyes you to cope with that situation. Um, and that's how you cope with it. And you can steer quickly or you can do what you've got to do. But if the orthosympathetic fails, it will just, in a sense, that will paralyze. And if that fails, then the para takes over. So we know what the para does. The para slows down the heart. So the heart can actually stop. It can go slow or it can actually stop. And you could, um, uh, you could go very white because... Uh, Blood, blood is yang, isn't it? And so that would create yang turns to yin. Yeah. And also, um, so you would, you know, you'd pee yourself, you'd evacuate your bowels or whatever. And you just, instead of running, instead of fighting or, or fleeing, you'd just be paralyzed, you'd just be stuck. Yeah. So we need to keep both systems <laughs> functioning. So how to strengthen. So. For a start, a balanced diet. So if we're eating a macrobiotic diet, then we don't have extreme yang food that will make the orthosympathetic nerves more rigid. We don't have extreme yin food that will make the parasympathetic lose its yang, yeah? So that's the first place to start. The other thing, of course, is, well, The digestive system is, is weak by being challenged, okay? And the nervous system becomes stronger by being challenged. So therefore, just having a macrobiotic diet strengthens the nervous system because macrobiotic food is easier to digest. So going back to that seesaw I showed you at the beginning, the, the digestive system isn't overworked as much. So that means that the nervous system can be stronger, can be more sensitive and more sharp. So to strengthen the parasympathetic nerves, obviously we avoid the strong yin, but um, Shizuko used to recommend air baths. I find air baths are great for people. So that's just being naked in the bedroom with the windows open, you wrap a big blanket around you and you just throw the blanket off, get the cool air to your body. And you can, if, you can build up doing that for longer periods of time. If you're tougher, then you can have cold baths or cold showers or jump in a lake or something like that. And obviously that's yang Isaac, but it's really good for you. Um, it will really strengthen the autonomic nervous system. So walking barefoot in nature. So you get that earth energy. Um, doing body rub, rubs, hot body rubs. And you do hot body rubs. You know, you do that in the evening. You can really, really feel that it opens the body up. It relaxes it. So you can tell it's alkalizing it. It's activating the, the, the power. Um, meditations where you calm the mind, um, especially with a longer out breath, or Michi always calls the mind of no mind. So that, that can be, you know, sitting, but even you could even be running and have the mind of no mind. As long as you're not more hung up on where you're going compared to where you are, then, and you emphasize that out breath, then uh, you get the mind of no mind. Martial arts, Qigong, all these activities are strengthening the power, strengthening the autonomic nervous system. Uh, so for the ortho, if it's got become rigid, we need to loosen it up, like body massage, ginger compresses, going for jogging, not too, not, not too contracting, but you know, gentle jogging, dancing, um, relaxing therapies. Barefoot Shiatsu, the way Shizuko works with that beautiful, used to work with that beautiful rhythmic motion from the foot that really kind of joggles the body around you know um i remember i had a friend who was a health visitor there was a family she went to and uh, the boy there was eight years old and his best friend died and so he just went out and he bounced on the trampoline all day like 10 hours or something on the trampoline just getting that out just that kind of rhythmic just shaking things out just the way an animal would uh, That's it. Bingo. So do you need a commercial break now?
No, that was terrific. That was really, that was so well done, well prepared. The information is, is useful, is interesting. It's, I, I, I loved it. I think you did a terrific job. Anyone who wants to learn about yin and yang, this is a good way to do it as well as the specific information. Yes. So I, I really appreciate it. You did a great job. I'm going to stop the recording after once more thanking you. I really appreciate all your efforts. Well, thank you. It's fun to be here.